Carl Sagan seminar series today, Wednesday, uh, May 26th, 27th, excuse me, 27th. And we're at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. And um, these, I just want to say that these uh, seminars are open to the public as well as our local scientific community. And um, we offer a gourmet meal of peanut butter and jelly. And um, <laughs> also, we're recording these seminars, and you can find them, uh, links to them both at the SETI.org website and also. Um, on YouTube now. Um, I also wanted to mention that because they are being recorded, we ask that you save your questions till the end of the seminar if possible, and that way we don't have big gaps in, in, uh, in, in the recording um, that aren't as pleasant to listen to online. <laughs> anyway, today we have the pleasure of, of having Ron Landis of NASA Ames as our seminar speaker. And Ron started out his uh, pursuit of science by studying astrophysics at Michigan State University and then went on to work, I guess, in, at various planetariums, um, primarily in the East Coast, is that? Uh, actually, uh, Rochester, New York, and oh. Abrams Planetarium at Michigan State. Uh, oh, okay, mm -hmm. so anyway, several. And then he began his career at NASA, um, uh, I guess, at, um, at the Space, Telesco Space Telescope Science Institute um, near, um, near Baltimore in uh, planning and moving target groups, intimating um, observations on the Hubble Space Telescope, and essentially being a, a co coordinating um, scientific information between the science and uh, uh, science and engineering teams. Um, more recently, he's worked on a, numerous other mission projects, including the Rossi X-ray Time Explorer at Goddard, and um, he's been an International Space Station Flight Controller at Johnson Space Center and also led uplink operations on Cassini-Huggins and um, Huggins, and also um, worked on the Mars, uh, the Mir, Mir rovers, Mars exploration rovers, both Spirit and Opportunity at JPL. So he has a lot of experience, and actually a few minutes ago, he described himself as being the equivalent of Sigourney Weaver's character on Galaxy Quest. Um, if that gives you an idea of the kinds of uh, work he might have done. Um, I don't think he, I think it's a modest comparison. <laughs> anyway, today he's going to talk to us about the Constellation um, project and one possible objective or destination of Constellation, which would be looking at near-Earth objects. And with that, I'll pass the, pass the microphone on to Rob. Thank you. Right, thanks, Jeff. Thanks. <clears throat> uh, before I get started, it might be useful to uh, ask how many folks here know what the Constellation program is at NASA? Just a show of hands. Actually, that's a pretty good percentage, roughly half, uh, it seems. So let me give you my, in the interest of time, let me give you my one beer sip or wine, sip of wine conversation as to what Constellation is. It takes a couple of beers to tell you exactly how Constellation evolved and came about. But in a few sentences, <clears throat> many people remember the Apollo program. The Apollo program not only developed uh, the Apollo spacecraft capsule, the Saturn V rocket, the Saturn 1B, and the lunar lander. Uh, uh, Apollo developed all those programs uh, and so on. Similarly, Constellation is the program to take us back to the moon, other destinations hopefully, and involves uh, the lunar lander, which is now called Altair, uh, the Ares V rocket, which is the real game changer. You see it in my title slide here up to the upper right, the Ares I rocket, and the Orion uh, capsule, which is essentially used to bring the crew uh, off the Earth and back through the atmosphere. I currently work, even though I currently uh, am an Ames Research Center employee, I work in uh, Dave Korsmeyer's Division uh, Intelligent Systems. Uh, most of my time is spent at Johnson Space Center in the Lunar Surface Systems Project. We stood up a Lunar Surface Systems Project because when humans do go back to the moon, you don't want the first words to be, okay, we're here, now what? Um, you want them to be a bit more involved and, and engaged. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the NEO team and about how this uh, thing came about, the idea of going to uh, near-Earth objects. Uh, near-Earth objects are those objects that are defined as coming very close to Earth's orbit within uh, 1.3 AU. Many of them cross Earth's orbit. Uh, there are subcategories of those objects as well, which I'll get into a little bit later. <coughs> uh, but for a fraction of the delta V it takes to get to the moon, that's the amount of energy or oomph it gets to move from, you need to move from point A to point B to point C in space. For a fraction of that energy, you can go to a number of near-Earth asteroids. And our team did a study. 
Uh, of course, Pete Warden was uh, involved in the political end of it. Dave Korsmeyer led it. Uh, resident scientist at JSC was Paul Abel. Dan Adamo was a consultant, a former FIDO who loves to do uh, interplanetary trajectories. FIDO is flight dynamics officer in, in JSC language, uh, another flight controller. Dave Morrison, who's here in the audience as well, uh, was a consultant. Uh, Ed Liu, uh, at the, an astronaut at the time, was now at Google. Larry Lemke, Andy Gonzalez, both at Ames. Tom Jones, not the singer, but the other guy, a former astronaut and asteroid scientist. Uh, Bob Gershman, Ted Sweetser at JPL, Don Yeomans at JPL, a number of other folks, and of course, uh, uh, Lindley Johnson at NASA headquarters. Despite what you may have seen in cover stories in popular journals, whether it be Popular Science, this came out about a year ago, uh, the Million Mile Mission uh, uh, on Air and Space Magazine, or even a French magazine uh, last year as well, I want to point out that this, what I'm going to share with you today, was only a phase one technical feasibility study. It was nothing more than that. I also want to be clear that uh, NASA has not endorsed this mission concept yet. However, we have briefed higher ups at, at NASA. At the time uh, when Alan Stern was the head of the science mission directorate, he invited us on a couple of occasions to come uh, to headquarters and brief the joint ESMD, Exploration Systems Mission Directorate, and SMD, Science Mission Directorate, colloquia. The work that you're going to see was done a couple years ago and is based on a few month study of the phase one effort. Will there be a phase two study? That's a big question. Um, Dave Korsmeyer and I are supporting the Augustine Commission that is re-evaluating uh, where we're going to go with human space flight. Uh, one of the other destinations could be NEOs, uh, near Earth objects. Part of, part of this involved looking at what was done in the past. For the longest time, I always thought that John Lewis uh, and Tom Jones, uh, University of Arizona, were the ones who first had the idea in the mid-80s about going after near-Earth asteroids. Um, but it turns out that was not the case. In a very Indiana Jones uh, fashion, uh, Dwayne Day, a uh, colleague of ours at uh, the National Research Council, uncovered this paper by Eugene Smith in 1966 about using upgraded Apollo hardware uh, to go to a near-Earth asteroid, such as Eros, the largest near-Earth asteroid, in the 1974-75 apparition of that, of that object. That year, that asteroid got within uh, 0.15 AU of the Earth. Uh, you see a number of other studies here as well. You recognize some of the other luminaries, Mike Griffin, Owen Garriott, just before Mike Griffin had become a NASA administrator. Uh, he had uh, led a, a study looking at what else you could do with uh, the, uh, uh, what was the constellation, what was budding into constellation, it wasn't called constellation at that time. So what are the possible launch vehicles you could go after uh, uh, NEOs? Uh, well, there are a number of them. Put a Saturn V here, just to the left uh, for comparison. We first looked at a low budget idea of using a Centaur upper stage um, on an EELV, that's an evolved uh, expendable launch vehicle, uh, such as the Atlas V Heavy or the Delta IV Heavy, and uh, docking uh, the CEV, the Crew Exploration Vehicle, the Orion Vehicle, to that and going. We also took a look at the standard way of how we're going to probably go back to the moon, launching the Ares V with cargo or the lander and having the uh, Orion Vehicle dock to that. Well, midway through, we were told, midway through our study, we were told, well, don't stop there. Think of the single launch option, which I'll talk a little bit more later. Could you use an Ares 4 or an Ares 5 in a single launch option to go after these things? And these are some of the things that uh, the uh, Augustine uh, Commission will also take a look at. Not to insult anyone's intelligence, I use this for the uh, uh, public affairs type talks uh, I've given. Here's, uh, of course, the limb of Mars. Ceres and Vesta to scale, roughly to scale. These are actually, by the way, it's kind of topical, Hubble Space Telescope images of Mars, Ceres, and Vesta. Uh, you'll hear it in the news coming up, but the first destination for the Dawn mission will be to go to Vesta in about 2011, and then a few years later, 2014 or so, we'll arrive at Ceres uh, and explore Ceres. These are main belt asteroids. Uh, and despite watching those movies like Armageddon and so on, a Texas-sized asteroid, Ceres is roughly a Texas-sized asteroid, um, and it's the largest asteroid in, in, uh, that we know of anyway, uh, is the largest asteroid in, in, in the inner solar system. Eros is the largest near-Earth asteroid. In the longest long axis, it's about 38 kilometers long. 
Here's another comparison. Uh, the long axis is here. It's rather peanut shaped or potato shaped. And to scale is uh, about half a kilometer across is the asteroid Itakawa. Let me go to the next slide. And you'll see the asteroid Itakawa uh, to scale with uh, the space station to the lower right here. This is the current configuration of the space station. And you see roughly to scale uh, the Orion spacecraft. This is the thing that will take us elsewhere, take humans elsewhere in the solar system. But we're primarily going to use that to uh, you know, transit the atmosphere. I want to point out a rock here that is about uh, 50 meters across or so, Yoshinodai. You might notice that these features on this particular asteroid have Japanese names. Well, when you first go to a body, you end up having the privilege of naming those features. Um, Yoshinodai is about 50, uh, 40 to 50 meters across along its long axis. Uh, an object that size, about 101 years ago, uh, schwacked into uh, uh, the Tunguska region of Siberia, uh, destroying, devastating about 2,400 square kilometers of forest. 50,000 years ago or so, an object about this size, smaller, uh, perhaps a little bit smaller, uh, crashed into Arizona, leaving uh, Meteor Crater, which you all know uh, and seen. Um, so objects are penetrating the atmosphere uh, as we get to know more about them with probably greater frequency than, than we've realized. And I'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So it's kind of interesting to go, perhaps go to these things before they actually come here. I want to give you a sense of the rate of uh, uh, discovery for the NEO population. Back in 1800, we didn't know about the asteroids uh, uh, until uh, uh, Giovanni uh, Piazzi uh, discovered Ceres, the largest one. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, a handful of others were discovered, Vesta, Pallas, Juno, and so on. What you're going to see here, as I step through here, um, you're going to see it populate with green dots and red dots. The red dots are the near-Earth asteroids. And this is what the inner solar system looked like uh, uh, around the turn, of the, night, the turn of the last century. Again, the sun's at the center, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, um, or what we knew of it. These objects have always been here. Um, we've only been discovering them uh, in recent time. Come up to 1990, it looks like it's starting getting a, to be a, birdie, a fairly busy place, 1999. Now, Bear in mind, these dots are not to scale because you could stand on any one asteroid and not see another asteroid um, at any time. And as of a few years ago, it looks like it's a pretty busy place in the inner solar system. Now, if you have a fighter pilot mentality, you think like a fighter pilot, and that's a different type of mentality, um, and not have the chicken little mentality, you can think, wow, it's a target-rich environment, and we have them all to ourselves. <laughs> that is one way to look at it. Now, this is only a two-dimensional projection onto the screen here. These are things that are in a variety of orbits uh, and so on. And the ones that we had want to go to initially uh, with initial capability with, with the uh, Constellation hardware are those asteroids that are in Earth-like orbits, not too far out of uh, the plane of the ecliptic and, and uh, in Earth-like orbits about the sun. Let me go here. Oh, um, I should update this chart here. I updated it as of this morning, but there are uh, now we're pushing on to 6,300 known NEOs. Uh, with new surveys that hopefully will come online, such as PanSTARRS-4 uh, at Mauna Kea and uh, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which will go into Chile, you expect to detect several more NEOs, uh, hopefully all of them down to 140 meters. Uh, of that number of 100,000 NEOs that we expect to, to find, we'll probably find 20,000 PHOs, or potentially hazardous objects. Now, the definite, you know, astronomers and whatnot like to classify things and put them in bins and so on. A PHO is a subset of NEOs. A PHO is uh, those objects that come so close to the Earth, about 0.05 AU, they have a, a reasonable hazard to the Earth. Um, uh, and it's the PHOs that we'd like to go to. But don't worry, we'll, we would not be there long enough to upset it or anything like that and make it to... Uh, uh, shellac the earth or anything. And these are the easier targets probably to get to. And uh, when we started the study, let me focus on these numbers up here. When we did this, when we finished the study, uh, there were about 4,000 NEOs, maybe 4,100 NEOs that we knew about, and probably on the order of 600, 650 PHOs. So uh, there have been almost 2,200 new NEOs that have been discovered that we have not even looked at as potential targets, but a small group of us are looking at those 
right now as potential targets to possibly go to. What are the number of small NEO impacts to the Earth? This is uh, from Department of Defense. Uh, DOD has reclassified this data, so we, I don't have any more. And Pete Warden's looking to, working to get that uh, declassified. Um, and uh, according to uh, I get this from Lindley Johnson, uh, there are about 30 such bursts per year with energy comparable to Hiroshima impact, uh, 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 Hiroshima uh, uh, burst event. Um, most of these burn up in the atmosphere. However, some do punch through. Uh, back in late October, uh, an asteroid called 2008 TC3, from the moment of discovery to the time it impacted in the Sudan, is probably no more than half the size of this room, maybe no more than five meters, 10 meters, I'm guessing. Um, uh, from time of discovery to the time of impact was about 18 hours. Uh, and there was another one in, uh, that hit in Peru uh, uh, last year as well. Anyway, I just want to give you a sense over the last couple of years what, what, the, what the impact rate looked like uh, on, 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 the, on the Earth from 2003 to 2005. Uh, the key to finding good targets are going to be the next generation surveys, uh, which include uh, uh, PanStars 4. PanStars 1 is having issues. It's on Haleakala. PanStars 4 is supposed to displace the uh, Hawaii 88-inch telescope on Mauna Kea. Um, and then LSST is supposed to go in in Chile, the large uh, synoptic survey telescope. You're going to see this timeline a few times throughout my presentation in different contexts. Uh, I just want to give you a sense of how many missions have gone to uh, primitive bodies or what's coming up uh, in, 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 the, in the near future. Near Shoemaker, rendezvoused with uh, uh, the asteroid Eros, that's the largest near-Earth near object, near-Earth asteroid, back in February 14th, 2000. Hayabusa um, arrived at uh, uh, the asteroid Itakawa uh, back in September 2005 and is on its way back. In fact, next summer, we don't know if it has sample or not, it went to an S-type asteroid. Um, it will uh, uh, re-enter the Earth's atmosphere uh, above uh, Australia. Uh, Dawn. It's not going to a NEO. It's going to uh, uh, two main, large main belt asteroids. And MOT, which has been in pre-phase A study at, at Ames here, um, was looking at going to the asteroid Apophis. Hayabusa 2 um, is uh, probably going to go to a C-type, a carbonaceous type uh, NEO. Here's the 1999 JU-3. They're going to launch on a Japanese H-2 rocket and hopefully bring back sample from, from that. Uh, Hayabusa 2, they've learned from Hayab the first Hayabusa mission, uh, have a new avionics package on board, new uh, 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 software, and so on. Rosetta is currently in flight. Uh, it just flew by Steins, the asteroid Steins, back in 2008. They had an anomaly on board um, with their autonomous navigation system. So you have no close flyby images of it. You only have distant images of that uh, uh, asteroid. They're still working as to what happened, because they want to be ready for another main belt asteroid, Lutetia, uh, in 2010. Lutetia is a large main belt asteroid. It's about 95 uh, kilometers or so across. Steins was about five kilometers across. It'll finally arrive at a comet uh, in 2014, drop a lander on it as well. Uh, Marco Polo uh, was a, going to be a joint Japanese and ESA uh, mission. ESA is the European Space Agency, but last week in Paris, I saw those talks break down and dissolve uh, right before uh, my eyes. Uh, it was a very valuable lesson learned when it comes to international collaboration on these types of missions. Both parties or all parties need to have clearly spelled out roles, responsibilities, uh, understood, agreed to, and concurred upon. Um, and Marco Polo will probably not, I suspect, will not get funded by, uh, uh, by ESA as part of their Cosmic Visions program. Um, so before we send humans, we'd want to send robotic precursors cheap robotic precursors if possible, uh, not something like a, a discover, necessarily a Discovery class or a, a New Frontiers class. However, we could learn from such missions as well. And we want, if we go, we want to stay there for a while. Um, you don't get much with the flyby. You want to stay there for a while and characterize uh, the NEO. Um, uh, I put high-res high, high cameras, a LIDAR for topographical mapping, gravitational field survey, and get a good shape on this, because you want to map out non-benign morphologies at this thing if you're eventually going to send humans there. I also put a couple spectrometers, if possible, maybe a small lander or hopper package on it. Um, 
what would be the objectives is bear in mind this is we always have a struggle of how robotic missions can support human missions and it has to be clearly spelled out up front we are sending this mission to support an eventual human mission it may very well be that some neos that we go to will decide you know this is one we're not sending a human to um, but in our mind, we have uh, this would be the same way that the Ranger, Lunar Orbiter, and Surveyor uh, program had supported uh, uh, the Apollo program. What we learned from it, um, things what we would not go to for at least the first human, first two or one or two human missions, would not want to go to a binary system because these are so gravitationally loosely held together. It's actually a chaotic motion. Would not want to go to a rapid rotator. Would like to go to a slow rotator, i.e no more, you know, one rotation every seven hours or something like that. Uh, would not want to go to one with potentially active surface uh, or, or something with non-benign surface morphologies. And I'll show you some images of the asteroid Itakawa uh, here momentarily. Uh, the same things that we learn with robotic missions from proximity ops, uh, surface ops, are absolutely applicable to human missions. Uh, Objectives, I'll, I'll leave my slides here uh, 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 at SETI for folks to take a look at. Um, I've already talked about this as well. Um, if the precursor is still alive, and God knows we've had uh, missions to Mars like uh, MGS or MER that have far outlived their, their, their expected lifetimes, you can imagine uh, such a mission at an NEO still being alive when a human crew finally arrives. And that could aid in navigation and also provide uh, excellent uh, educational public outreach uh, opportunities as well. Um, it could be a relay for science equipment left behind uh, at the NEO. So what, are, what would you do with a precursor, a cheap precursor? Here I have a picture of Laddie superimposed on the moon Phobos of, of, of Mars. Uh, uh, Laddie is planned for launch in March 2012 on a, a Minotaur 5 rocket, uh, LADEE, I should identify the acronym L-A-D-E-E, -E, Lunar Atmosphere Dust Environment Explorer. Um, uh, the, here you see a Minotaur 4, I think it looks like uh, it's at Vandenberg Air Force Base. But what better way to convert MX missiles or Peacekeeper missiles into space launch vehicles to go after these things cheaply? or reasonably cheaply, or putting them on ESPA rings, such as an Atlas V. This is the MRO mission en route to launching it uh, out to Mars. And this is pr uh, probably from a DOD mission. But you can put an uh, ESPA ring, E-S-P-A, uh, EELV secondary payload adapter ring. Could you do some interesting things with that? If you go geosynchronous, you can go interplanetary. And uh, the DOD is interested in possibly doing this as part of their space test program, what secondary payloads. Uh, could you possibly put on this as these heavy rockets as we get more uh, experience with them, uh, you, you, more margin becomes available. When uh, uh, Hayabusa first arrived at Itakawa, one of the first landing points was uh, uh, they were thinking about looking at was uh, Woomera. Well, I, I, this is an Australian name. Well, that's because uh, uh, when Hayabusa comes back, it's going to be landing in Australia. So they thought it was clever by giving these things some Australian names. Um, well, this surface turned out to be too rough and not that pebbly. Uh, so they took a look around. So you hang around and you want to survey uh, this thing. And uh, on the other side of the asteroid, at the neck portion, where the head of this thing meets the, the main body, um, this looked like very smooth terrain to possibly set down or attempt to set down. And the uh, team actually set Hayabusa down twice by the letter A that you see here in point A here in the Muses C. Um, let me go to the next one. Uh, but before doing that, it released several target, uh, several target uh, uh, devices, uh, tracking devices to gauge range, range rate, and so on, and, and to mark uh, uh, the territory in which it was going to land. You see a, a shadow effect here. This is the shadow of the spacecraft, the little glow around it. It's like the glory. I've seen this flying a number of times. When you're looking, up, if the sun's over here and you're looking down on the ground, you can see a little, uh, uh, I think the Germans call it, uh, is it Gegenschein or whatever, uh, uh, on your shadow on the ground. That's the exact same thing you see here. You also see it in the Apollo photographs uh, when you see their shadow taken opposite the sun. You see a little glow around the head of the astronaut. Um, so that's the same effect here that you see. The pebbly surface here is on the order of uh, 
um, you see pebbles maybe a centimeter, a couple centimeters across. And it was here that uh, uh, Hayabusa set down. Don't know if they got sampled. The intent was to uh, launch uh, or, or uh, detonate a charge and launch a bullet into the uh, regolith and hopefully kick up sample, and the sampling horn would capture that. Uh, not yet sure if we have sample. On the other side of the, the uh, object, where they were originally going to set down, you saw rocks this size, meters across, and was, weren't so sure you'd get a sample there. Uh, Ajme Yano, uh, JAXA sent me this. Here, this must be a Lexus, and of course you see a sunbather here, all to scale. The interesting thing here, though, is this white rock here. It really is a white rock. It's not photoshopped in. Where did that come from? If you're an astronaut, that's someplace I'd like to uh, collect that and see where that came from. Other parts of the body have black boulders on them. And here's one example of the black boulder on the head of uh, uh, Itakawa. That really is black. Uh, it's not a shadow effect. That really is black. You see other uh, non-benign morphologies, like right here to the, to, uh, to, to the left here. It's not a place I'd probably want to send an astronaut necessarily. So you want to map these things out. Other interesting thing about this, well, this is, uh, is th there are no craters. Where are the craters? Or have the craters been shaken out as other impacts have occurred? Um, now we'll go back to the human mission uh, 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 idea. So what launch vehicles could we consider? Well, the poor man's uh, way to get to a NEO might be this upper left-hand quadrant with uh, an ELV, an Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle, uh, uh, and using the Centaur upper stage as our Earth departure stage, and the, uh, uh, the CEV. Uh, or the way we're going to go back to the moon, launch the crew, then launch the cargo. They dock in low Earth orbit. And then that whole contraption goes on out to uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the moon and lands on the moon. Midway through our, uh, uh, our study, uh, Jeff Hanley, the Constellation Program Manager, asked us to take a look at single launch options. And single launch options are much sexier, simpler, and elegant. Um, many people forget that the later J-series missions to the moon, that's Apollos 15, 16, and 17, launched in lower low Earth orbit than what the previous missions had done. The previous missions, we wanted to check out the nav systems, subsystems, and, and all that before we went to the moon. So we launched in a higher low Earth orbit before we finally went on to the moon. As we got more confidence in, in, the, in the Saturn V hardware, uh, there are trades that ha occur if you're willing to cope with only making two revs around the Earth, two orbits about the Earth or less, and then going directly to the moon. Similarly, as we gain confidence in the hardware that we hope to build, I can see the same thing for uh, uh, missions to, to NEOs. And that's why we like the single launch option. But when would you go? Here you see another timeline. It's already sorely out of date. Um, uh, we have only eight more missions, no, seven more missions, uh, shuttle missions, uh, that will take us to the end of 2010. If you haven't seen a shuttle mission, no matter what you might think about human spaceflight, it is the most incredible experience. It's a very powerful experience. Uh, I highly recommend go seeing it. Later this summer, we will launch the Ares 1X. It's uh, uh, just a test mission. It's a suborbital flight. It's a four segment solid rocket booster um, with a dummy fifth segment and a dummy upper stage. Um, it's mostly a pad fit check, procedures check, and all that. Then we have a series of uh, abort that, of various systems, a transonic abort, uh, board at max Q altitude, uh, maximum dynamic pressure at, at, at a high altitude, an off nominal attitude abort and a high altitude abort. Um, some of these will take place out in the desert at White Sands. Others will take place at the Cape. Ares 1Y, I've now heard, is going to be probably canceled. That was going to be also suborbital. Orion 1 is probably going to shift to 2015. No humans on Orion 1. And hopefully by Orion 2 now will be a manned mission. That will be 2015 or 2016. I've also seen a separate set of charts that uh, push this a couple years to the right to 2017. But I'm not worried, because that gives us more time to find more appropriate NEO targets. Um, just to take you through uh, one two-dimensional chart, how long would these missions last? This is using a single launch opportunity with an Ares 5. Uh, we looked at uh, up to 90-day round-trip missions. Um, and we found that uh, uh, we should probably take a look at probably 120, 150, 180 day uh, uh, missions to see what we could do. Uh, the problem is, uh, 
we're really stressing the system uh, in terms of consumables. You have to feed and clothe and astronauts and, and so on. They have to go potty. They have to go to the bathroom and, and all um, and keep them occupied. Um, and also radiation. We did not look at radiation. This is a long time to, send, to spend uh, beyond the magnetosphere. Uh, uh, and in the way the Orion is designed, uh, we could very well survive the 1972 solar event, or the 89 event, or the 2003 Halloween storms. Uh, it's the galactic cosmic rays and the secondaries they produce that we did not look at. How do you, how do you get around that? But this was a feasibility study. We just wanted to see, could you get out there and come back? Um, the direct entry, we haven't looked at skip entries, the direct entry speeds are on the order of 11.1 .1 to 11.2 kilometers per second. That's very much in family with what uh, uh, the Apollo missions uh, had experienced. I mentioned delta V. To get to a lunar outpost, uh, if you have a lunar outpost near the equator, uh, the total delta V is about 9.1 kilometers per second. If you retain margin, go to the poles of the moon, you probably need uh, a total delta V from launch from the Earth, off the Earth, uh, and then in orbit around the moon, down to the moon, and back off the moon. It's going to be about 10 kilometers per second total delta V. You could go to Phobos or Deimos for a fraction, a substantial fraction of the total delta V it takes to, uh, to uh, get to the lunar outpost or, or, or do a lunar sortie. However, the trips are much longer. The round trip times would be much longer. Uh, here are a sampling of NEOs. I just put some days here, not to confuse the chart, but just give, give you a sense. One target that might be interesting, we don't know the rotation rate, but we have an idea on the size based on its absolute magnitude, is 1999 AO10. It'd be a, uh, for a 150-day uh, mission. We also looked at uh, uh, 2000 SG344. Not that we'd go to this body, but it's a real body that you could possibly think about. A 90-day mission or 120 or, or up to 180-day mission. Let me go on to the, keep going here. You remember I, I mentioned that uh, you'd want to go to bodies that are in uh, Earth-like orbits about the sun. Um, and uh, here is a geocentric view of a 90-day mission to asteroid 1991 VG. Again, will we really go to this one? This is going to be about the size of the spacecraft. It's between 30 to 40 meters across. For the public, it's not so sexy. For science, it's really, any one of these things is really cool because of the samples you could bring back. Here you see the moon's orbit to scale to give you a sense. This is a sprint mission out and back. Uh, of course, we violate our delta V budget. This is up to 9 to 10 kilometers per second total delta V, but it's a sprint out and back. Or we could go in a gentle lobbing motion out there, and we're well within our delta V budget, but it's a 175-day mission uh, round trip time. Some of these things, uh, 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 as they enter the Earth-Moon system, there's interesting momentum transfers that take place, and they end up in horseshoe-like orbits uh, before uh, c continuing on. Uh, the target I had mentioned before, uh, 1999 AO10 on a 150 day mission. Um, uh, we don't have good data on it yet in terms of rotation rate and, and uh, uh, absolute size or a shape model, but this is one such thing that you could go to. Here's the heliocentric trajectory. Here is the uh, geocentric trajectory. Uh, again, it's a kind of a lob out. You go out to the NEO and you see the moon's orbit to scale to the upper, upper right. Uh, and counter it, and you ride it back in, and just before it gets too close to the Earth, you come off of it and uh, re-enter the Earth at speeds that are with Apollo 13, Apollo 10 uh, uh, mission. Um, there are two windows to launch to humans to NEOs. You can either get it when it's uh, uh, just as it's coming in to close to the Earth, and that closest approach to Earth pop off of it. We kind of like that because psychologically, you're always going to be getting closer to Earth once you get to the NEO. The other time is to meet it when it's at its closest approach to Earth, and then just before it gets too far away, come back. And the delta V is about the same. Um, what else would we want to have on the CEV? Well, on Apollo, we had the Simbe. This is, uh, I think, from Apollo 15. Uh, you see the, the Simbe. It's about, uh, I'm going to guess, from me to the door away on Apollo. It would be a little bit smaller on uh, uh, the Orion. And we are retaining requirements to have a SIM bait for uh, uh, remote instruments uh, and, and so on. SIM bay is a science instrument module bay. Uh, what would you put on it in that SIM bay? You can imagine a hopper or a rover for multiple trips to from the surface. Uh, 
supplemental collection of other materials that are dif uh, d difficult to reach on areas of the NEO. Uh, maybe if you want to maintain ultra pristine samples, because when you bring samples in, no matter how hard you work or diligently you work to maintain that uh, pristine, as soon as you bring them into an atmosphere, uh, they're contaminated. Um, uh, the radar that we have on uh, the Orion isn't just used for docking to the International Space Station or docking to other spacecraft, but it is tunable. And you could do, imagine some subsurface tomography that you could do. Many of these things are uh, rubble piles. And what does the subsurface kind of look like? Uh, you could get a sense of that. Um, the greatest thing, I'll look, point to the last bullet, the greatest asset at the center of this, having worked both human missions and uh, robotic missions, the greatest thing is the human crew. Humans have the ability to adapt and change to their environment and conditions. Uh, human, you could ask a human to stick your arm into the asteroid and ask him or her, how does that feel? You know, you, you can't really get that with a robot. Um, uh, and the key thing is, uh, God forbid, if we have, we have to uh, divert one of these things, direct interaction with the surface of the uh, uh, near-Earth asteroid. Um, you know, emplacement of uh, 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 an ion propulsion drive or emplacement of uh, uh, ordnance detonated that you could detonate later and do uh, momentum uh, change experiments on and, and all. Um, the biggest thing about the human crew, sample, sample, sample. I was in Paris last week uh, for the uh, Marco Polo uh, uh, meeting and folks there are talking about you know micrograms or milligrams of sample. Well, humans can bring back tens of kilograms, if not hundreds of kilograms. We're retaining requirements in uh, the Orion uh, design to bring back as much as 250 kilograms of sample uh, from the moon. And the neat thing about that is you can collect these macroscopic samples taken in geological context. A robot can't do that as well, uh, except with a, a massive amount of uh, I interaction. Um, I'm going to go to the next one just in the interest of time. So you put all this together. On the bottom you see here, uh, when the surveys we expect to come online for LSST or PanStars uh, uh, 4, uh, when we started the study, there were about 4,000 known objects, maybe almost 100 uh, PHOs. Uh, in 2011, that's just a couple years away, we expect that number to grow up to about 10,000 objects and 2,000 PHOs. As time marches along in the next decade, we'll probably have as many as 100,000 known NEOs of that number, 20,000 PHOs. Uh, talking with Don Yeomans, statistically, uh, it, we'll probably have 1,000 targets we could go to by the end of the next decade that could be reachable by uh, the Constellation systems. Um, you see the, the graph up here, where I have the, all the rocket vehicles. Again, I'm sorry this is out of data. I have to shift this. But the question becomes, when do you go? And, and uh, then you see up here uh, the robotic missions to these various bodies. I'd love to see this populated with more missions to, to NEOs, small and cheap missions to NEOs. When do you go? And this becomes uh, a political uh, uh, decision at the highest levels uh, of, of government. What is the value of uh, humans going to, to NEOs? We could demonstrate human capability beyond not just low Earth orbit, but beyond the Earth-Moon system. Um, when and I've seen this happen on space station. Uh, you get an us versus them attitude when it comes to the crew and ground. Well, for humans dealing with a seven to ten second one way light time delay, that's going to be very annoying for both the ground and the crew. The crew's going to have to become their own little mini mission operations director, be very system savvy and knowledgeable about the spacecraft and all, and make real time decisions because the round trip light time is going to be between 14 and 20 seconds. Uh, now, for robotic missions, that's nothing. Uh, you know, having worked on Cassini, that's a three-hour round-trip light time. It's a robot. You know, the, the motto we had at JPL, kind of jokingly, was uh, if it has air, we don't care. And you got more time to think about things uh, with a robot. With humans, you don't, you don't have that luxury. Uh, something we did not do was uh, look at the radiation uh, issue. Um, and that's something that we'd have to do in a phase two study. Uh, is this possible? Uh, uh, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know. Um, the other things that uh, uh, come, come along uh, are uh, NEOs. You can do, our team focused on NEOs for exploration, but there's obviously ISRU. 
about 30, maybe 35% of the NEOs that we've observed from uh, Mauna Kea using the NASA IRTF uh, are, have a water signature. Some of them, uh, as much as 20% by mass water, and all you gotta do is just heat it up in the water, in the form of hydrated minerals, uh, heat it up in the water it would just come out. Um, if you have water, uh, we know this for certain, I'm not so sure there's water on the moon, uh, if you have water, you have rocket fuel. Uh, rocket fuel with a high ISP. Um, it also demonstrates the utilitarian nature of the uh, Constellation program. You know, you're using this architecture you designed for the moon, oh my gosh, you can go to some other places. And you start seeing an elegant cycle emerge, hopefully I've convinced you of that. Um, you quantify, track, and characterize NEOs, assess for the impact threat, select accessible targets, visit and conduct operations around these asteroids, and while learning to deal with the threat, we can exploit these puppies uh, for their resources and future exploration efforts, especially for you know, Mars feed forward and whatnot. So just some findings, uh, 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 just some summary findings. Uh, you can reduce total delta V if you can, uh, willing to accept longer mission duration, uh, have shorter stay times at the NEO. Uh, also use a gravity assist, but from the moon, that's probably only two to 300 meters per second more delta V, but if you're that, uh, I'm happy to take any extra oomph uh, uh, we can get. I mentioned the NEO launch windows. <coughs> Excuse me, they're usually a couple windows, uh, a couple weeks long. Uh, and there are uh, roughly two equal launch opportunities. The key is the NEO must be in the right place in its orbit at the right time to have, and have a really close approach to the Earth, which could allow a very fast low delta V mission. We were asked by the Constellation program by Jeff Hanley, could you use this hardware to do something else, like go to NEOs? And the answer came back, yes. And we keep finding more and more of these things all the time. In fact, there are 2,000 that we haven't even looked at yet uh, since we finished the study uh, uh, just over two years ago. I want to give you a few takeaway thoughts from the presentation. Our team focused on the exploration nature of uh, NEOs. It's a new way of thinking. We're not trying to redefine the solar system. Many people at NASA look at uh, um, going somewhere else as uh, it has to be a large spherical body in a deep gravity well. Uh, going to NEOs, you don't have that deep gravity well. You don't have to claw your way down into a gravity well. You don't have to claw your way back out. Use it for science. Um, the sample return, just as the Apollo samples changed the way we thought about the, not just the Earth-Moon system, but the solar system, um, you can go to these bodies, unprocessed or various degrees of processing um, uh, from the sun, uh, and still they'll retain their primordial clues as to the history of the solar system. Uh, Mars feed forward. Um, you can um, think of these things, uh, uh, at least from an operational sense. If we can go to NEOs, we can go to Phobos and Deimos. If we can go to NEOs, the asteroid belt starts opening up. If we can make it to the asteroid belt, then the Trojans around Jupiter, uh, the Trojan asteroids, uh, seem to make sense. Resources, I mentioned that, uh, at least in the, in the NEO population. I think it's about 30% of the ones that we've looked at anyway at, uh, on the IRTF. Uh, that are rich in water, some by as much as 20% by mass, in the form of hydrated minerals, it's just not water on the surface. And finally, NEOs for planetary defense. If 2008 TC3 had crashed through a couple skyscrapers in Manhattan instead of in some remote desert in the Sudan, um, uh, I think it would have gotten a lot more attention um, than, than what it has gotten. Uh, so will we get a phase two study? I don't know. Uh, here you see uh, what the CEV or the Orion looks like now. Uh, kind of looks like an undersized uh, uh, service module back here. Here's the lunar lander. What combination of parts from the lunar lander from either the descent stage or upper stage could you use as an airlock at the NEO? So you can send astronauts out uh, to collect stuff on the surface. And could you surround it with tanks of hypergol fuels, hypergolic fuels, provide uh, radiation protection. Uh, it's something we have not looked at. Here's another depiction of, here you see the ascent stage rising up from the moon and, and, the, and the CEV. If you think forward, here's a transhab uh, stage with CEV off to the right here um, uh, to and from Mars. Uh, so if you think forward like that, this right now is fiction, just to be clear, it's fiction. Uh, but uh, uh, this part here is not fiction. We are really building uh, the CEV. Um, I'll go ahead and stop it there. I think it's a good time to go ahead and stop, and I'll be more than happy to take any questions you might have about this study 
uh, what it might mean. Uh, bear in mind, I'm just a simple caveman mission operations guy. I know how to fly things in space, land on Mars, do uh, orbit insertions around planets. But doing something like this is very different. You don't have to do an orbit insertion burn when you go to an NEO. It's like going up to the space station and docking to it, but you don't have all the convenient handholds and latch mechanisms and so on. Um, and you have to be, the astronauts who go EVA will have to be very comfortable with underwater splunking because that's what it's going to be like. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I'll be happy to answer questions. Um, are there any questions? Oops. Hi, Rob. Um, this is Jeff Van Cleve, and I've seen your talk before, and it's, it's always fascinating to me. And I'm wondering whether, at one point, um, um, there was a certain uh, desire that you and Paul go away with these ideas so as not to distract attention from the lunar landing. Has there been a change in attitude such that this might actually save exploration if the moon turns out to be a dry hole? I mean, the, the preponderance of scientific opinion is nowhere near telling us the moon is a land of milk and honey. So uh, to get water out of these hydrated minerals, that might actually save exploration. Have you been successful in changing minds at the higher echelons? That's a very interesting question because we're in a dynamic phase right now. Um, uh, I'll mention that uh, uh, the Altair program manager uh, and our sponsor, uh, Kathy Lurini is the Altair program manager, and Brett Drake was our sponsor uh, at JSC within Constellation for this study. There, is, there has been a shift, and they see, you know, this might very well save the Ares 5. You need the Ares 5 because that is the game changer. Ares 1 will just get us into low Earth orbit, barely get us into low Earth orbit. And, uh, um, but now folks are beginning to see this, and you even had Chris Scalise uh, a few weeks ago talking to Congress. Uh, I think it was a House, uh, House science subcommittee. Um, he mentioned other destinations and included NEOs. And now we have the Augustine Commission, which uh, mm. of course Meyer and I are supporting, and NEOs uh, uh, will, will probably be discussed in there, as well as other destinations. There might be an opportunity for uh, like large space telescopes at SEL2. Uh, we don't have a plan for that or anything, but uh, if you go out to SEL2, unlike Hubble, you half your time looking at our target is not obscured by the Earth being in your way. And uh, uh, so that might be another place place to go to, uh, some Earth Lagrange point too. Uh, so uh, um, we're seeing a shift. Uh, all options are on the table. And um, uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. And hopefully in six or seven months I can come back here or, or you can catch a colloquium at Ames and uh, we'll have an update for you. But right now, it's, it's being discussed, and it seems to be a shift right now, but the Ares 5 is the game changer, and the Ares 5 not just saves us for NEOs, but could save us for the moon. Um, I wonder what the current evidence is for the damage of gamma radiation, and if you got approval for the phase two, how would you start to investigate the radiation issue? I, prob um, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know what it does to the human body. And uh, the great thing about human missions is when they come back, you can share that with us. Uh, 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 if we stay here, I don't want to go away in the dinosaurs. I mean, they were here a lot longer than we were. They never had an NEO observing program. They never, they, they never developed into a spacefaring species. And look where it got them. Um, it gave rise to us, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, um, I would include, uh, a few medical guys, uh, not just an MD, but also an MD probably with a PhD that can look at radiation. Uh, and what kind of shielding do you provide? How much shielding does, uh, if you're surrounded in a small ascent module that I, that I showed uh, back here, um, if you're surrounded with hypergalls, you can still have views out the window. C can, is that doable? What does that do psychologically to the crew? Uh, we've seen situations or crew coming back from Space Station Mir or from ISS, even goes back to Solyut, um, where th they go up friends, they come back, they don't really talk to each other. Mm -hmm. That's a long time to spend with somebody. You better really like them a lot. Um, so, and what do you put in the mix of crew? It should be half male, half female, all male, all female. I don't, that is a loaded question. I don't know. That, that is a, so, but to answer your radiation question, I just don't know. So. 
sir. Okay, so let's follow up with the, the question about the, um, the resources, and I think it also impinges back on the radiation. So what about thinking more about putting forward, rather Zubrin had suggested for Mars, I putting um, plants on some of these asteroids, building up the amount of water that you need, right, both for fuel and for radiation shielding, because now that you've got it up there, right, the cost of launch is now zero, and it's just a matter of the delta V at that point. Just, just to get there and then move but, on. Right. Um, and you could see that all over all these, so you now have... Oh, God, yeah. Right, uh, all yeah, over the place, you, right? You, you could see a conveyor belt, like to Mars or to the other parts of the solar system as, as well. For the phase two study, that is like in the way beyond category. But, and, and for ISRU demonstration, we'd probably want to put initially just technological demonstration. I don't know, something that could fit in a shoebox. And that is another detailed thing we have not looked at. That's like an innovation uh, type of we did not look at. In thinking in our simple caveman fashion, here we got these big rockets, what could you do? That, that's what we looked at first, a phase two study. Go more detail, a phase three or phase four would have to look at that. Um, but no, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir. You're, pre you're preaching to the choir here um, at this point. Could you give a little uh, uh, sort of an intuitive feel for the, the gravity on one of these objects? Uh, you talked about it's not so much a landing as it is a rendezvous, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you know, do you have a, talk a little bit about that? About that how okay. Um, uh, it'd be like doing an EVA on space station, except without the handholds. And in terms of falling, depending on the size of the thing, something like Itakawa, I think if you dropped something on in terms of what Itakawa is made of and, and what, the, what, what the density of that material is and, and all. Uh, but something to fall a few feet could take as long as 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, so essentially, you're, 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 micro, you're, you're zero G, effectively. You're zero G. You're, you're floating. So a lander is not really required. Yeah, that's right. A lander, that's, uh, that's the elegance of the, uh, of the NEO idea is uh, let's say we have problems uh, developing we have problems developing this contraption to land on the moon. Well, an NEO mission could help develop this further um, uh, if we're not ready to land on the moon. The reason why uh, we did not land on the moon is earlier is because uh, uh, the LEM wasn't ready. Apollo 8 was never designed to go to the moon. It was designed to be a low Earth orbit checkout of the LEM and uh, the command service module. But thankfully, we had some pretty sharp people, forward-thinking people, willing to take risk at NASA. It was uh, George Lowe and Sam Phillips at the time. Sam Phillips was an Air Force general in charge of the Apollo, Apollo program, and George Lowe, uh, um, I forget where he came from. I think he came from uh, Rensselaer or something like that. They came up with this idea uh, of, well, what about if we just send Apollo 8 to the moon? Oh my god, the LEM's not ready. Uh, well, we've got to go there sometime. What if the service module main engine doesn't restart? We've got to go sometime. Uh, and that was a huge quantum leap up. So the NEO idea could be the Apollo 8 of the next generation. Um, and you think that uh, folks were inspired by the Hubble servicing mission last week that recently concluded, and all the people that came down to the Cape. Um, and I have a personal passion with Hubble. It was the first spacecraft I cut my teeth on. I was a nostalgic feeling for it. And let's step it back a little bit. What about when Apollo 11 launched to the moon, the millions or half a million people that thronged to the Cape? Imagine if you have a mission to an asteroid sitting at the Cape you're going to have to beat people back by the millions to not watch that thing go off because um, uh, it's going to be that incredible. So for, I think, public inspiration, it's interesting. I'm giving you a long, rambling answer. Um, but in terms of the gravity, it's, it's a microgravity environment. Proxops, rendezvous, uh, be just like, kind of like station with some challenges. And you'd have to, if you go to the surface, you'd have to, depending on the asteroid, you either have to anchor yourself to it, dock to it, essentially, or you could just be um, uh, station keep with it uh, and uh, imagine an astronaut on an arm or other arm or other contraption reaching out and picking pieces of the asteroid off. Then what happens when you kick up all that dust, depending on what the regolith is like? And every time we've gone to someplace else in the solar system, I've always been surprised. What happens to the dust? What is the predominant force? Is it the solar radiation pressure that finally kicks it off? Or is it the local gravity? And how long does that take for that to happen? The dust, so all these operational concerns you, know, you start entering in your head, which screams for the demand of robotic precursors to, to kick up some dust and more. So I probably more than answered your question, but that's, 
that, that's what it's like. It's going to be like underwater splunking and more. Yeah. The 7 to 10 second light delay, that's for voice communications? Voice communication, anything. So no. why not uh, send a younger generation of astronauts and let them text? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I'll make it so noted, so noted. I think I answered my own question, but the, my, my thing is that if, if it, are you assuming that these missions are still going to have a, a crew rocket launch and then the, the payload separate? Are you still assuming that there's going to be two launches required? Everything's on the table. Um, personally, I like the single launch option. It's much more elegant. It's much more simple. We had issues with dual launches back in Gemini. Um, I think there's only maybe, I don't know my history that well. You're going to prompt me to look it up. But there's only one or two Gemini missions where they got both launches up on time. I'm not counting Gemini 6 and 7, which was an ad hoc thing that was put together where they launched two Geminis together and, and uh, uh, they rendezvoused and waved at each other. But uh, uh, where they actually launched an unmanned thing first and then the crew. I think there are only, there's probably only two that have succeeded. There was Gemini 8 with, uh, that was only a partial success with uh, Armstrong and Scott. And then the last Gemini with uh, Lovell and Aldrin, Gemini 12. Those were the only two. Uh, we learned from that experience, but uh, uh, I, this is me personally talking, not me as a NASA person. I like the single launch option. And uh, uh, it's just so much more elegant and simple. Uh, you're not wasting valuable propellant in Delta V and low Earth orbit docking and maneuvering. And meanwhile, because the radiant uh, uh, heat from the Earth, you're boiling off that cryogen. I just want to make one rev, one and a half revs of the Earth, and go. Um, I don't want to loiter around wasting time in, in, in propellant in, in low Earth orbit. Yeah. It isn't a big argument for two launches that you don't want to safety rate this giant rocket for human flight. I mean, well, isn't that a big... Well, that's almost a non-starter because uh, at some point you're going to have to safety rate the Earth departure stage for humans anyway, and you have uh, a launch escape tower on top anyway. So, uh, 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 and we're also going to put valuable payloads. If we use if we use the Ares Five for other things, let's say a Jupiter, a massive Jupiter orbiter, or a massive Neptune orbiter, or whatever else, to uh, uh, we're spending a lot of money on this. It's it's going it, to, you know. <coughs> but we're still early on in it. We're still so early on in it. Uh, and uh, this, you know, politically, it's a political decision. There are six, maybe seven gates you have to go through. Um, Apollo enjoyed this. I don't think Shuttle has or ISS has. Don't yet know about Constellation. The seven gates you have to go through. Support at the highest level, i.e. presidential. We're having the Augustine Commission now. Congressional support, not just authorization, but appropriations. Congress authorizes NASA to do a lot of things, but you have to have the, the ducats to do that. A popular culture to support the endeavor. Uh, Apollo enjoyed that. Uh, um, competent NASA technical management uh, in place. And personally, I think we have that with Constellation. Um, five, I would call, I uh, put the, uh, competent technical NASA people underneath that competent technical, technical uh, NASA management. Six, technology to support all this. Seven, all the contractors, and this relates to number six and number three above, all the contractors supporting the whole effort. Uh, uh, we had that with Apollo. Now we have all this discussion. Should we go on EELVs or not? Uh, we have this fractious uh, uh, discussion. So those are the seven gates in my mind that anything needs to go through. ISS and shuttle did, did not enjoy those things. Apollo did. And how do you recapture the imagination? Um, one of the things that uh, Hanley, Jeff Hanley has told both me and Wendell Mendel, make this more than what Apollo was. Uh, and as a boy growing up, I thought, Oh, we're always going to go to the moon. You know, then I go into high school in the late 70s, and oh, the shuttle program's kind of starting. I always thought we we're going to go further. And this is just a demonstration of, uh, of going further. Um, uh, but the Augustine Commission will come up with some, some ideas as to uh, how we can uh, do better, hopefully. So. How, how do you think that the new NASA administrator, being an astronaut, will think of this kind of stuff? Um, there's some astronauts that don't do well in management roles. There are others that do very well. Uh, uh, Charlie does not know me, but he'd recognize my face. Uh, I think he's, uh, um, this is my personal opinion, 
I think is an interesting, logical choice. Uh, uh, he met with uh, the president last week, um, uh, and we're preparing charts for uh, uh, General Bolden, uh, just to make him aware of this is one idea. There are other ideas out there as well, such as large telescopes at SEL2. Politically, it was a political decision as well. It always is. Um, uh, I don't know what direct line he'll have with John Holdren, who's the president's science advisor, or with the president himself. Um, uh, I think he's a very good commander. Um, he has the Florida connection because he flew with Senator Bill Nelson in 1986, uh, just before the Challenger accident. Um, he also has the political connection with Maryland, with Senator Barbara Mikulski. Uh, he went to Annapolis as a kid. Um, uh, he went back to Annapolis after he left NASA as commandant of a uh, uh, the Naval Academy. His other connection to Maryland is he is on the Hub Hubble mission that actually deployed the Hubble telescope, STS-31, uh, I think. Um, and he, of course, he has the Houston connection because he's from there in, in, in the crew office. And he's also, I think, he's a logical, to me, he's a logical choice. Uh, I'm sorry to see Mike Griffin go, but uh, no matter if John McCain was voted in as president, all people who are in those political appointee roles uh, tender their resignation. So. Uh, uh, I think it'll be very interesting. I think he'll have a good, easy time going through his uh, Senate confirmation hearing. Uh, he's a very likable and decent man. He's had to command aircraft wings, so he has an idea from being in the Marines. NASA's not the Marines. But uh, he, he knows how to handle large organizations. And he knows what's involved with human spaceflight. Um, I don't know about his robotic sensibilities or whatever, except for the Hubble deployment mission. Um, but uh, I think he's a logical choice. Okay, I have two final questions, and they're very short. And that um, is the projected cost or the postulated cost of a mission to an NEO, say, for a 100-day um, mm -hmm. travel time, comparable to a lunar mission with with a human uh, human crew? Uh, it is. I'm going to answer it this way. Um, it's cheaper than maintaining an outpost on the moon, but it's probably the cost of a sortie mission to the moon. Okay. And depending on how you want to amortize the cost, I'm hesitant to cite a figure because um, what dollars are you using? Two thousand five dollars. I said postulated. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's probably on the order of a couple to three billion dollars. But in, in ten years, that number is going to change. Yeah. I don't know what, what it will be. Okay, and then finally, um, has anybody extracted rocket fuel from nominally anhydrous minerals? No. Okay, because I hear you hear about this a lot. Harrison yeah. Schmidt, of course, is the big uh, proponent yeah. of lunar uh, lunar uh, energy or lunar fuel. I, no, not that I know of. Okay. Yeah. Hydrated minerals. Uh, Normally anhydrous minerals, so low yeah. water, you know, PPM level, yeah. like most of these have yeah. or are projected to have. Yeah, uh, it, it, no, not that I, not I, I doubt it. And, and one of the things you want to do with a human mission is put small technology packages yeah. on to see could you do it For in the microgravity environment yeah. without. Uh, right, so it's just a, it's just a, people yeah. have thrown that up, up uh, yeah. out, you know, and I just haven't ever heard any uh, follow through. <laughs> no, there, has, there but, um, hasn't been that I know, that I know of. Okay, I guess we'll have one final question. Okay. Um, I suggest use uh, for the finances bailout unit. <laughs> Comment. <laughs> I'll bear that in mind. I'll, I'll, I'll bear that in mind. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, Ron, for a really wonderful seminar. Let's thank our speaker again.